Sea Country, 10.30. Riho and Aisu were still clashing. Riho cursed himself for becoming too relaxed and lazy. Although his skill hadn't diminished, his speed was not what it once was, and it showed. He was taken to the defensive in this battle, and he could not turn the tables. He could hear the screams from inside the compound, and he would get glances of various battles, which were not going in the favor of his family. After blocking a strong blow from Aisu's blade, Ryuho used all of the speed he could muster to move as far as he could from the Raikage. Breathing hard, Aisu laughed at the man before him. Are we out of breath already, or is this just a clever ploy? If you are tired, then I should put you out of your misery now. Ryuho couldn't help but smirk at Aisu's cockiness. Put me out of my misery. Not to be full of myself, but I am not have the clan for nothing. Of course not. You are the head because your brother died, Aisu said sarcastically. His comment touched a nerve. Ryuho narrowed his eyes at the dragon summoner. You're right about that, but you are completely wrong about my power. It's true my brother was the rightful heir, but we both cut from the same cloth. I couldn't have wielded Heaven's Blade if I were weak. Also, I still have a few tricks up my sleeve. I bet you do, Aisu said while shifting into an attack position. The Minashu clan bloodline is also something to be feared, by most, anyway. <laughs> so he knows, not surprising when you think about who trained him. Black aura started to slowly come from Aisu, surrounding his whole form. I, however, I am one of the few who has the ability to combat a Keke Genkai such as yours. The black chakra started to erupt from his body. This took Riho by surprise. But then he realized what was happening. He's drawing Soro's chakra. It's possible since he has the contract of the dragons. So he's finally getting serious. This chakra is stronger than I expected. But I have no choice but to stand my ground. If I had Heaven's Blade, then I'm sure that I would have a much better chance at winning. Without the blade, my chances are not as good as I would like. If it was any other opponent, then it wouldn't matter. However, he has the Dragon Contract and Dragon's Fang. Also, he was trained in the Wicked Wind. Add all of that up, and it's not hard to see that he clearly has the advantage. But I'm always up for a good fight. It's been a long time since I used Nateke Raycon. Riho stated as he readied himself for another round. Shifting into his fighting position, a sky blue light outlined his body. Riho's eyes were no longer the color of coal. They were now the color of the morning sky. Ayaka's smile grew even wider. It's been a while since I've seen the uh, Nateki Raycon, but every time I see it, it is truly a sight to behold. His powers elevated dramatically in this form. He could probably go head to head with Cohen when he is using all five tails of Gobi no Hoko in this state. Well, so can I. This definitely should make for an interesting battle. For the first time in this battle, Ryuho shifted into an offensive position. No more holding back. It ends here. Yes. Yes, it does. Icy screams the black chakra started to rise, signifying that his power was growing. The blue light outline on Ryuho started to get brighter. Signifying the same thing, both the warriors were in a class that Vyu had reached and would ever reach. The power coming off them would have sent most warriors running in fear. Ryuho performed a couple slashes in the air with his sword. Razor's edge should hold him off. However, that was not the case. Icy swung his sword at the incoming blades, and as he did a loud sound, came from the sword, forming a visible dragon as it destroyed the blades flying at him. Ryuho had no time to be shocked. He jumped out of the way to avoid the sound wave in the form of a dragon form tearing him to shreds. Bleeding from the roof was so conscious enough to see the fight, Kayori watched her husband with blurred vision. Ryuho is getting serious. On the boat, Naruto got nervous as he felt Ryuho's chakra rise, as well as someone else's. Ryuho sensei, what the hell is going on to make you activate your Keke Genkai? Naruto turned to one of the crew members on the boat. When the hell do we get to Z Country? In about another 45 minutes, maybe even less, the man said to Naruto. What's going on, Naruto? Yumi asked. I don't know, but I feel a dark power 
and uh, Ryuho Sensei's chakra. Whoever that person is, he's strong. Not only to get Ryuho to activate his Nateki Raycon, but to still be able to match him and be stronger is truly amazing. Even if I were to use the five tails and I get control of the Yubi, I'm not sure it would be enough. Yumi, place your hands on Naruto's chest. Don't worry, I'm sure everything will be okay. Stop worrying, okay? Naruto knew something was wrong. Call it instinct or whatever. But he just knew something was wrong. Back at Sea Country, 15 minutes later. Ryuho and Aisu were having a battle that was truly of epic proportions. Every swing, every block was as if history had scripted this particular moment. This particular duel. Exchanging blows, Ryuho thrust his sword forward, hoping to impale Aisu. But Aisu, being as good as he is, spun around bringing his sword down with force. Avoiding the slash by ducking under it and trying a leg sweep, Ryuho's attack was dodged as the Raikage jumped forward, landing on his free hand to only push off of it to propel him into a front flip. He did a 180 degree turn in midair, so he could land facing Ryuho. When he landed, Ryuho was holding his sword high above his head, which was now glowing gold. Ryuho smirked at Aisu, who was giving him a curious look. It ends now, Aisu. You will not be able to dodge this attack. Ryuho said the attack in a low whisper. Golden Halo. He then struck the ground with all of his might. A golden ring shockwave spread from the sword outward. Aisu's eyes widened as the shockwave approached him on the boat. Naruto saw the halo that was created by Riho, causing him to think, What the hell? On a boat to fire country. Shinji's eyes were focused on the halo and so were Hayami, speaking in shock. The girl said, Shinji, that was... Yes, it was Golden Halo, one of our clan's strongest techniques. It is only taught to those who have enough chakra necessary to use it. If your father used that technique, then the situation is worse than I thought. Shinji answered the girl, who continued to stare as the halo faded. She closed her eyes and prayed. Mother, father, please be okay. Sea Country, 11 p.m. Ryuho was panting. The technique he used drew a lot of energy. When he looked around, he could see the bodies of enemy ninjas and his family. He knew that he didn't cause their death. That technique only did damage to those with ill will. He also knew that some probably avoided the technique altogether. Well, the lucky ones anyway. He knew, however, he was responsible for causing damage to the house. Kiori, who was now a couple of feet away from Riho, where the force of the blow had thrown her, panted. He did it. Riho was glad that it was over. However, his joy was quickly cut short when he saw Dark Chakra coming from a dust-filled area. When the dust dispersed, he saw Aisu with a few minor cuts, but very much alive. Aisu was livid. That attack had actually hit, and had it not been for his shielding flame technique that encased his body in a bubble, he would have been destroyed. His energy started to flare up, and he spoke to Riho in a malicious tone. You almost succeeded in actually killing me. I'm tired of playing. It's time for you to die. The Rakage moved into a position that caused Ryuho to becoming alarmed. The black chakra coming from him flared up even more. He was powering up for what would be the final attack. Shit, he's performing the ultimate technique of the Wicked Wind. Ryuho had no choice. I guess this will truly end it all. It seems we will find out which is stronger. His Hell's Fury or my dance of the heavens. Shifting into a stance of his own, his chakra flared up even more. The sword in his hand started to glow, causing the metal to look like it was made of light. He then vanished from sight, only to appear to the far left, leaving an image of himself behind. He moved to his right, leaving behind another image. This process continued until it was at least 20 rehos or images of him. To the naked eye, it would seem as if he was in 20 places at once. However, it was only after images. Aisu brought his sword in a cutting motion if it was left to his right, while spreading his right foot causing him to shift into a low attacking position. The images of Riho surrounded him. All the Riho slashed at the air with their sword moving it from left to right in an upward motion until it was high above their heads in their right hand. 
you could have saved the dramatics with your little dance and just shifted into the technique stance. You know the actual dance has no effect on me, and I know which one you are. I see turn towards the Riho, behind him to his left. That being the real Riho. He knew that whatever happened, whether win or lose, this would be it. Thought of the past started to enter Riho's head. Flashback. Standing over Riho was a 20 year old man with short black hair and the same midnight eyes. The other looking version of Riho with some slight facial differences. Offered his hand, giving him a warm smile. You're pushing too hard, Riho. If you keep pushing, you won't be able to train for a week. A 12 year old Riho does himself off. I have to train. I want to be stronger than you. You want to be stronger than me? Say why. And a flashback. Memories kept flooding his head. I didn't have a justified answer then, but now I have one for you, brother. Strength is only part of it. Our desire to protect those we care for is the other part. It took me up until my battle with Kagai to see that. Flashback 16 years ago. In a grass field on a windy night, a man with dirty blonde hair stained with blood lay on the grass bleeding to death. Ryuho stood with his back turned to the man. His clothes were battle-worn, and he also had cuts gracing his body. With the blade of the heavens, or heaven's blade, held in his right hand at his side, he turned his head enough so he could see the man on the ground behind him. Guy, you brought this in yourself. I wish it didn't turn out like this. Maybe Shinshiro would be alive. The man with dirty blonde hair and brown eyes laughed, while coughing up blood at the same time. You <laughs> are pathetic. <laughs> if it wasn't for that treacherous sort, <laughs> I would have won this battle. You are finally strong enough to get your revenge. But isn't that against the clan's teaching? <laughs> Bucking hypocrites. The man continued to cough, and it was getting more violent. Riho looked at the moon and spoke softly for him to hear. Revenge, when you killed my brother nine years ago. I did want revenge. You of all people know that I wouldn't be able to wield this sword if I was fighting for revenge. The sword wouldn't allow it. The trials that I took four years or so ago prepared me for this moment. When uh, I would have to confront you and face you, but not for revenge purposes, but to make sure that you wouldn't hurt anyone again. I have a family to protect from people like you, the wife I just married. Shinshiro's son, who is going to be a great leader, everyone will be proud of someday, and the rest of the clan. Your goal is to put all of that in jeopardy, which is why I stopped you. It wasn't about vengeance, it was about protecting the future. More <laughs> frivolous <laughs> travel <laughs> from you, I will <laughs> see you. Hell, you bastard. <laughs> He continued to cough until the blood in his lungs started to suffocate him. He was dead a minute later. Riho walked away from the man, heading to the home which he had fought to protect. End of flashback. And now, I will do what I did all those years ago, again. Riho looked at the Rikage with renewed resolve. Riho and Aisu took off towards one another. Aisu with what looked like black flames around him, and Riho still in his Niteke Raikon form, which his chakra rising from his body. The ground beneath them began to break up as they closed the distance. At about 10 feet away, Ryuho, who had his glowing sword in his right hand, raised it to eye level. With a loud scream that came from him, Aisu didn't have time to react as the light covered the whole area, blinding everyone in the vicinity on a boat heading to sea country. The captain informed Naruto that they would be arriving in sea country in about 5 to 10 minutes. Naruto didn't really hear because the light that he just saw caused him to stare at the mountain in which it came from. Yumi, who was looking at Naruto, knew that she shouldn't have told him not to worry, but she did in hopes to comfort and ease his mind. It was pointless, and she knew that, but did it anyway. Back in Sea Country. The light started to die down, revealing the men standing with their backs to each other. As the light died down, and as the dust settled, both men were standing as if their attacks had no effect on the other. However, that was not the case. Riho smirked. <laughs> I guess it wasn't enough. The sword in his hand shattered. Blood then erupted from his chest. 
He slowly fell to his knees. He then fell forward, crashing into the dirt, face first. The Raikage, on the other hand, was not smirking. Blood erupted from his chest at about the same time as Riho's. However, he used his sword as a crutch to hold himself up. He was breathing hard, and for the first time in a long time, he was injured. After slowly regaining enough strength to stand, he turned to see Riho lying on his stomach. You. I had no idea that technique would be that dangerous. His train of thought was cut short as the pain caught him off guard, causing him to fall to one knee. Kadan and the remaining soldiers landed in front of the Raikage. Kadan was surprised to see the Raikage this injured. This was something he thought to be impossible. Walking over to the Raikage, he bent down and placed his arm over his shoulder. Sir, we have finished what we came here to do. Let us take our leave now, sir. The Raikage still looking at the man who lay before him and beating with anger in his eyes. Yes, let us leave this place. I need to tend to my wounds. In mere seconds, the group of shinobi vanished from the mountain. Kiori, who was in just as bad shape as Riho, used her remaining strength to crawl up to her husband. When she got to him, she could see that he was weak, but he was still alive for now. He struggled to put a smile on. He is coming. He spoke as if every word had pained him to say. Who are you talking about? Kiori said to her dying husband. Heaven's blade. I can feel it. Naruto. Here. Almost. Here. Riho informed his wife. With his remaining strength, he reached up to his neck where a silver chain was. He ripped off the chain and placed it in Kiori's hands. Make sure, Naruto. Get to Shinji. He then raised his hands to caress her cheek. I love you. Tell Naruto to look out for his sister. Tell him he, Shinji, were the sons I never had. Tell him, tell Hayami, love her. See you on the other side, my love. Ryo's hands began to slowly slide off of her cheek, hitting the ground without a sound. As his eyes closed, she couldn't help but see a smile on his face. This in turn caused her to smile. I will see you soon, my love. Very soon. Twenty minutes later, Naruto and Yumi had finally arrived at Sea Country. He wasted no time heading to Minashu Compound. With Yumi on his back, he speeded through the town to get to his destination. Naruto was running up the mountain the stairs with all the speed he could muster with his seals activated. When he slowly reached the top of the mountain, Naruto and Yumi were shocked at what they found. Naruto saw the townspeople running around, gathering the bodies, but he also saw that the compound was basically destroyed. The ground beneath him was jagged and battle-tested. Yumi was horrified by what she was seeing. Bodies, limbs, they were everywhere. Naruto saw makeshift tents with nurses and doctors tending to the patients who didn't look like they had long to live. Naruto was like a zombie. He just walked towards the house. One of the town's girls that recognized him called out, Naruto! Naruto turned to face her. She ran up to him with tears in her eyes. You have to come with me. Kiori has asked whoever spotted you first to bring her to her immediately. Naruto's face brightened up a little. Kiori, mom is okay. Where is she? The girl headed toward an area with people surrounding something. She motioned for Naruto to follow. Yumi stood looking at the scene before her. This was a massacre. As the town people ran about moving bodies and gathering limbs, she stood there thinking, Oh no, Naruto, I will react when you find out that Hayami. I don't even want to think like that, but it is a high possibility. She shook her thoughts off and ran in the direction Naruto headed. On a makeshift bed, Kiori was gazing upon Naruto, who was doing all he could to hold back his tears. That's what happened here. It's the reason we were attacked, Naruto. Don't give me that look. I know I'm dying, and you know it as well. Naruto shook his head. No, you can't die. Ryo sensei is gone. Shinji, Hayami. Naruto closed his eyes as he said the last name. You're all I have. Don't leave me, mom. Please, 
Yumi walked up to Naruto and gave Naruto a sympathetic look. Kayori noticed the newcomer who was approaching Naruto. When the girl placed her hand on Naruto's shoulder, it caused him to look at her with tears threatening to fall from his eyes. She couldn't help but to feel sad as well. You must be Yumi. Naruto has told me so much about you. Naruto and Yumi turned to face the woman laying on the makeshift bed. I'm Kaori. Yumi smiled at the woman. It's finally nice to meet you, Kaori. Kaori started to laugh. It's funny we had to meet this way, Yumi. When did you come closer, Yumi? Yumi walked up to the lady, and as she got close enough, Kaori grabbed her hand. She was feeling the girl's hand with both of her hands. Soft hands, you are such a gentle soul. I can see why Naruto fell for such a girl as you. I'm expecting you to take care of him while I'm gone, and to teach him some proper table manners. Even though Yumi only knew this woman for about two minutes or so, she couldn't help but to cry at sad words. Yumi nodded. Yes, Kiori. His table manners are atrocious, and I will do what I can. But I can't promise anything. You know what they say, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Yumi's attempt at a joke caused Kaori to laugh. I suppose. Naruto, come, I have something that I need to give to Shinji and Hayami for me. Naruto couldn't believe what he heard. He saw the destruction and didn't think that anyone had survived. Where are they? She smiled at him. They were heading to Konoha to meet up with you. Anyway, here. She handed him two chains. One was Ryuho's silver circle with a weird design in it, which was the clan symbol. The other was one that Naruto recognized. It was the fox chain he gave the girl three years ago. The chain popped as she was training. She asked me to fix it. Naruto, I don't have much time, so I will say this. Ryuho told me to tell you. Shinji and Hayami that he loved you all. He also told me to tell you that you boys were the sons he never had. Naruto, you will leave Hayami in your hands. Protect Naruto and tell her that mommy loves her. You know I will, but I won't have to because you are going to tell her yourself. Naruto said, causing the lady to shake her head. Naruto, stop this. I already told you. I know it's hard for you, but... People die all the time, Naruto. It is my time, son. It is my time. Naruto closed his eyes to keep the tears from falling while shaking his head. No! I won't accept it! I can't! Enough! When she raised her voice, everyone froze. She gave the warmest smile she could. Naruto, look at me. Naruto opened his eyes to look at her. I love you, but you have to let me go, son. You are an amazing person, a young man who has the power to change the world. I will be watching Naruto. I expect great things from you, Shinji and Hayami. She turned to Yumi. I also expect some healthy grandchildren in the near future. This caused the girl to blush. She then turned back to Naruto. Naruto, continue to grow stronger and make all of your dreams come true. She motioned for Naruto to come closer. When his face was in front of hers, she kissed him on the forehead, and spoke so only he could hear. Goodbye, my son. Naruto's eyes expanded at the words that reached his ears. Naruto immediately lit himself to see that her eyes were now closed. Everyone in the room was crying. The nurses, doctors, and villages who were in the room knew her as an active and well-liked citizen in the town. Yumi was crying because she was close enough to hear what she said, and the simple fact that seeing a person die was always sad. Naruto was just staring at Kaori's motionless body. He began to shake her. Wake up, mom. <laughs> nice joke. Naruto shook her a little harder. Uh, okay, mom, this, this isn't funny anymore. He continued to shake her. Wake up, mom. I said this isn't funny. Not even noticing, tears were slowly forming in his eyes. Wake up, mom! Wake up! Wake up! One of the doctors touched his shoulder. She's gone, my son. Naruto narrowed his tear-filled eyes to the doctor. She's just sleeping. She's tired. She'll wake soon. You'll see. 
Yumi spoke in a soft tone. Naruto. He looked at her and cut her off. Just wait, you'll see. She's just tired. She needs her strength. Doctor, you have to get food ready because she's going to be hungry when she wakes up. The doctor looked at the boy. Son, I'm sorry. I know how hard this might be on you, but she... Naruto yelled at the doctor. I said she's just sleeping. She's not dead. She can't be. She wouldn't leave us like this. Not like this. Not like this. A river of tears started to fall from his blue eyes. Naruto didn't want to accept it, but he could no longer deny it. Hiyori was dead. In a low whisper, with his head down and his fist tightly clenched. Why? Why am I the only one who has to always have it hard? Why would he do this? How could he do this? Everyone around Naruto started to stare, and Red Chakra started to seep from his body. And the chakra slowly covered his body until it looked like he was surrounded by a red flame. Naruto looked up, revealing that his eyes were now red with slits in them, and a deep voice that terrified all who were around. I'll kill them all. I will kill them all. Naruto started to scream. The evil coming from the chakra scared everyone, including Yumi. Naruto continued as one tail formed. Next, there were two tails and his facial features were becoming more feral. Yumi looked at Naruto. This is my Naruto. This has to be the fox. I have to do something or he'll lose himself. Naruto continued to power up, reaching the third tail. The fox was happy. Yes, foolish boy, keep drawing my power. Because when you hit six tails, I will have control once more. This time, I will not be stopped. <laughs> Uh, what the hell? Why is he no longer drawing my power? Yumi is now hugging Naruto. Naruto, you have to stop this. This isn't you, it's the fox. Please, Naruto, just stop. Tears spilled from her eyes while hugging him. Come back to me, just come back to me. The fox was pissed. That stupid bitch. I really hope she fucking dies. Naruto, who was lost in the moment and in his own anger, realized that Yumi was holding him. The red chakra slowly faded, the tails started to disperse, and the red slit eyes were once again blue, but the tears remained. While Yumi was still hugging him, Naruto fell to his knees and started crying. She held his head. It's going to be okay, Naruto. I will do all I can to help you get through this. The townspeople were all looking at Naruto with fear. The power that came from that boy had so much killer intent in it. That it was almost inhuman. Naruto ignored the looks. He slowly stood up. Yumi, who was on the ground, looked at him. Naruto. Naruto did a couple of hand seals and slammed his hand in the ground. In an instant, Naruto, along with Yumi, was on the head of Yamabota. Yumi was shocked to find herself in a giant toad, but the townspeople below were even more shocked. Yamabunta surveyed his surroundings. He then looked up to see Naruto on top of his head with a young lady. Why have you summoned me, Naruto? And to see country, of all places. Shut up with your complaining. I don't have time for it. Take me to the leaf village now, Naruto said in a demanding tone. You little gawky, show some respect. Naruto was getting pissed. He didn't have time for this. If what Kiyori told him was true, then Hayami and Shinji were in danger and he didn't want to lose anyone even close to him. Listen, you toad, I don't care if you get all itchy. I need to go to the village now. We're wasting time. Blowing smoke from his pipe. Too bad. Gritting his teeth, Naruto managed to get out. You fucking! Before Yumi cut him off, Gambota, sir, please, can you get us to Konoha? Naruto's friends are heading there as we speak, and they are in danger. The frog boss looked at the girl. Who are you? I'm a friend of Naruto's, his girlfriend actually. Please sir, Naruto's just a little on edge right now. Can you please get us to the leaf village? Yumi asked in a sweet tone. The frog spoke, directing his words at Naruto. You can learn a thing or two about respect from your girlfriend there. I'll get you to Konoha, but you're going to owe me for this, Gaki. I don't care, just gonna move on. Naruto said that uh, while never taking his eye off the direction that Konoha was in. The frog leaped off of the mountain, the force causing people to brace themselves or fall from the force. 
Game of Bunta landed a couple miles away, with Yumi and Naruto on the head of Game of Bunta. They were heading to Konoha, 2 a.m., Fire Country borders. Shinji was running at full speed through the forest. It would take him about three hours at the speed to reach Konoha. Ayami was on his back while he was running. Running for about five minutes now, he could tell someone was following close behind. His suspicions were confirmed when a couple of shurikens flew at him. He quickly jumped out of the way to avoid the shurikens. When he landed, a female was standing on the branch of a tree in front of him with an evil grin. I found you. What do you want? Shinji asked, knowing the answer. Well, for starters, I want you to die along with that little bitch in your back. If you hand her over, I might think about sparing your pathetic life, Komoko stated. Shinji put the scared girl down. She grabbed his leg. Why does she want to kill me, Shinji? I didn't do anything to her. Shinji answered the girl, but he was talking so Komoko could hear. I don't know why she wants you dead, but you don't have to be afraid. I will protect you, Hayami. How touching, if you must know. I plan on sending her head along with the rest of her body to the fearsome Golden Fox. Shinji said in a low voice, Naruto. The girl's smile grew. So, you now know what this is about, don't you? No, not really. I can only guess that you want to get Naruto back for whatever he did by killing her. If you ask me, that is something only a coward would do. Why not go after Naruto? Shinji asked. His question caused the female's grin to grow even wider. Why chase him when I can kill her and have him come to me? Shinji freed his leg from Hayami's grip and moved his hand to his sword. I don't think you'll have the chance to kill her. See, if I wasn't your opponent, you might have a chance. But since I am, you have no chance. That includes the other two with you that are hiding. Daki and Roba came out of hiding and appeared on opposite sides of Komogo. She spoke. Very perspective. You do know we outnumber you and the odds of you winning are non-existent. You talk too much. Just attack already so I can be on my way. Shinji pulled out a sword and spoke so only Hayami could hear. Hayami, I need you to head in that direction. Don't worry. I'll catch up to you soon. But Shinji, I'm... Enough. I know you are scared. But you are also Minashu, so act like one. Fear is something that holds us back. Don't be afraid. Just head in the direction to your left, Shinji said to the little girl. I can't leave you alone, Shinji. I don't want you to get hurt. Shinji pleaded with them to let her stay. Do you wish to stay by my side because you are scared to be alone? It really doesn't matter. Just go. If you stay, you'll become a hindrance. Get over your fears, Hayami, and go now. It is our fear that makes us stronger. The girl looked at Shinji and recognized hearing something like that before. He sounds like Big Brother Naruto. Flashback. In truth, fear is something that can make you stronger. End of flashback. The girl knew that she had to be strong. She nodded. Okay, Shinji, I will do what you say. The little girl took off and headed towards the direction of Konoha. Komoko didn't waste any time. She was speeding towards the girl who was running. As she got closer and closer to the girl with the kunai in hand, she was stopped by a sword. She narrowed her eyes at Shinji. You. I told you that I wasn't going to let you hurt her. Shinji jumped back when he saw the other two coming from both sides. He avoided their punches and landed on one knee. He slowly picked himself up. This is going to be fun. I haven't had a fight in a long time. Komoko was getting pissed. Another obstacle in her way. She charged at the samurai. Daki and Roba followed. Daki arrived on his left, throwing a punch that was blocked by Shinji's left arm. Roba came at his right with a kunai drawn. But when he went to swing, it was blocked by the sword in his right hand. Komoko came at him with a punch aimed at his stomach, but he blocked it with his knee. He used his chakra to blow them all back. Komoko was surprised that this guy was this strong. She backflipped into a landing. Shinji looked at all of his opponents. It was decided. The girl was the strongest, so she would die first. Shinji appeared in front of her before she could react. She looked at him as his blade descended toward her neck. However, Shinji was forced to jump back to avoid an incoming lightning strike. He landed a few feet away to see a man with blue hair and yellow eyes standing on a nearby branch. Komoko looked at the man. What are you doing here? 
Looks like I was saving you, three idiots. Here you are, fighting the second strongest member of the Minashu clan. And you think that your simple attacks would hurt him? You all are foolish. You came here for the girl, right? Then uh, go after her. Kumoko nodded and took off in the girl's direction. He looked at Roba and Daki. You two go with her. I'll take care of our friend here. You will take care of me, Shinji said in a mocking tone. Yes, you are strong, and I would like to fight you. I don't care about the death of the girl or the death of your clan. I just want to fight a worthy opponent. Ryuho praised your skills. That is the only reason I'm here. If you want to get to the girl, Cohen appeared behind. Shinji, who saw the movement, you will have to get past me. Shinji turned around to face Cohen. He wasted no time activating his Nitaki Raikon. I intend to. Cohen smirked and began to draw on the power of the Gobi no Hoko. Grayish chakra started to come from his body. We'll see. We'll see. Somewhere in the forest. Konohamaru and Hanabi were leaping from tree to tree. She was getting bored and frustrated. She didn't even know why she listened to Konohamaru. We're not going to find anything out here. Let's head back and get some sleep. Come on, Hanabi. It's still early. We're bound to find something. She shook her head at his enthusiasm. You are truly an idiot. We aren't going to find anything. Konohamaru stopped at a nearby branch. This alarmed Hanabi as she landed next to him. She looked at him. What's wrong? Why did you... He placed a hand over her mouth. Don't speak. I just heard something. She slapped his hand away. Don't you hush me. You didn't hear anything. Your mind is just playing tricks with you. Konohamaru gave the girl a serious look. Something she wasn't used to seeing on his face. You don't have to believe me, but I'm going up ahead to check it out. Konohamaru left her by herself. Hanabi looked up to the star-filled sky and just sighed. Why I listen to this idiot, I will never know. She took off after him, not too far away. Hayami was now scared. Komoko had caught up to her. Komoko was slowly walking up to the girl. I finally have you all to myself. I don't know what to do with you first. How about I have some fun with you? Komoko kicked the little girl in the head, sending her flying into a tree. The girl bounced off of the tree and landed on her knees with her hands in the dirt. She coughed up blood. This caused Komoko to smile even more. Yes, when I send your body to that bastard who goes by the golden box, he won't even recognize you. But first, she kicked the girl in the stomach, causing her to fly in the opposite direction. She skidded across the ground before coming to a stop. Big Brother Naruto, Shinji, where are you? Somebody, help me. I'm scared. Why does she want to hurt me? What have I done? Why? The girl stood up, using all the strength she could. She looked at the cloud Kinoichi and tried to run away, but fell to the ground. Gathering all the energy she could into her lungs, she screamed. Big Brother Naruto! Shinji! Help me! Daki and Roba, who were sitting in opposite trees looking at Kumoko, basically beat the girl to a pulp, laughed. Kumoko began to laugh as well. Sorry, sweetie, but no one will be interfering this time. You will die, and I'll make sure of it. Kumoko kicked the girl across the field again. Where are you, Big Brother Naruto? Shinji, Big Brother Naruto, you promised that you would. Tears started to fall from her eyes. Then a memory came to her. Flashback. It had been a month since Hayami had been returned home. Since that time, her father has been training her. The girl was giving it her all, but she was making crucial mistakes. Her father threw her to the ground. The force in which he slammed her caused her to cry. Crying isn't going to make your enemies have sympathy. It will only make them want to crush you more, because you just have showed them that they are in control. The girl who was sobbing spoke through her sobs. Then, they will have to deal with Big Brother Naruto. He, he promised he would protect me. Ryuho bent down to the girl's height. Naruto made a noble promise, and I'm sure he will do all that is in his power to not break a promise he made with you. But, what if you are fighting an enemy and he can't get to you in time? Look honey, I'm not saying that you shouldn't believe in him. I'm just saying that you have your own strength, and if you train your body, then you won't need Naruto to protect you. She stopped sobbing and looked at her father. I can be as strong as Big Brother Naruto? What about being as strong as me? She looked at her father, who just sighed. Okay, if you train really hard, then yes, you can. If you become stronger than him, then 
you can protect him, instead of him protecting you. Either way, get up so we can continue. The next time you cry, I won't go easy on you. The girl stood up, preparing to face her father. She looked up into his eyes. Allow me to say this. There will come a time when neither me, your mother, Shinji, or Naruto will be around to save you. What will you do then? Will you wait for help, or will you stand? And a flashback. Hayami slowly rose to her feet, holding her side. She looked at Komoko, who was slowly approaching, but stopped out of curiosity when the girl stood up. You stand, knowing I'm your better girl. Aren't you going to call out for Big Brother Naruto or Shinji? Komoko said, mocking the girl. Hayami shook her head. Big Brother Naruto can't protect me forever, and I don't expect him to. I don't know why you want to kill me, but I will stand against you, even if the odds are against me. Foolish girl, the very man you call to protect you is why I want to kill you. But I don't need to explain that to you. If you give up now and just take it lying down, I'll make your death quick and painless. Hayami shook her head again. I can't give up. My Bushido is to never give up. I was scared of you before, but Shinji and Big Brother Naruto are right. I see that if I don't face what I'm scared of, then I will be giving up. I'm not going to give up. Komoko was enraged. She slashed the girl across the chest with a kunai. The girl flew a couple of feet in the air. She jumped at the girl with the kunai, preparing to stab her in the back. Die, you little bitch. Komoko was stopped short as a blue sandal connected with her face, causing her to crash into the ground. Daki and Roba were now on alert. They went to Komoko's aid, who was now pissed as anyone could get. The group saw a spiky-haired ninja land on the ground with the little girl in his arms. Hayami, with blurred vision, only seeing the shadow outline, touched the face of her savior. I knew you'd come bigger than Naruto. She then passed out in Konohamaru's arms. He looked at the girl with a curious expression. How does she know, uh, bro? Roba spoke. He's a Konoha ninja. We should get out of here. I'm sure he's not the only one here. Komoko stood, holding her jaw. I don't care. I will kill the boy quickly, and then I will kill her. This coming from a weak cloud shinobi. Everyone looked at a high branch to see Hanabi standing above them, she continued. I don't know what your business with that girl is, but you are in fire country, and if you do not leave, we will have to exercise force. Komoko laughed. Are you serious? You're just kids. I will crush you two, and then kill the girl. Konamaru spoke. Why? Why do you want to kill this little girl, and how does she know Naruto? Even though his back was turned, she gave him a sinister smile. To slaughter close to 300 ninjas for her, she has to be important to him, right? If she's dead, he will seek out the one who did it. When I send him her head, he will seek me out. And I'll be looked at the little girl. She was about the right age, as the girl Naruto talked about being his little sister. But why was she not in sea country where she lived? Konamu spoke once more. This little girl in my hands is Hayami Minashu. Komoko spoke one word. Yes. Hanabi landed in front of Konohamaru, who stood up from his crouching position. He gave Hanabi the girl. Hanabi looked at him as he stepped forward. Hanabi, get her to Shizune immediately. Are you an idiot? You can't defeat all three of them. Hell, I would be surprised if you could beat one. Hanabi was expecting to get a rise out of him, but he just gave a smirk. I don't intend to win. That girl needs medical attention, or she's gonna die. You're faster than me, Hobby, which is why I'm asking you to take her to treatment. She just looked at him, utterly shocked by his statement. It was true that this girl was severely injured and needed medical treatment. She was also shocked that he would admit that she was faster and that wasn't the Konohamaru who always bragged. She didn't know who the guy was before her, but it wasn't the Konohamaru she knew. Konohamaru spoke again. Why are you still here? I said she needs to be treated. Get her out of here now! And I'll be nodded. Try not to die on me, monkey boy. And miss a chance to take you out on a date? Not a chance. And Abby just shook her head and vanished from sight. Komoko was about to go after her when Daki placed a hand on her shoulder. The girl's going to die. The cut was too deep. The only way she could be saved is if their Hokage, Tsunade, of the Legendary Three was to heal her. That girl has an hour at best. Idiots, they don't know about Shizune and Sakura, 
both women are just as good as that old hag. And just Hayami's luck that one of those women happens to be close by. But Amru smirking when he thought the last part. Komoko picked up on this. What the hell are you smirking about? Nothing. Just clearly you underestimated Konoha. And Abi said it best. Leave here, I'll be forced to take action. Komoko didn't like this kid. One day he interfered with her kill. And two, he actually kicked her. She threw a kunai at him, causing him to jump out of the way. Daki appeared in front of him and planted a punch in his gut. Konohamaru flew back, but he smirked as he was sent flying. Boom. The tree behind Daki exploded. This caused a ripple effect and the trees next to Komoko and Roba exploded as well. Komoko covered her eyes. Shit, it was a diversion. That old fuck is trying to give us the slip. Roba responded. I know, but if we move now, he could be setting more traps. Konohamaru is on a branch about 200 yards away. I should buy enough time until Hanabi can warn the others. But I should set more traps, just in case. Konohamaru leaped off of the tree and proceeded to do just that. Elsewhere in the woods, Kashi and Asuma were patrolling. However, they both stopped and looked at each other. That chakra, it was demonic, Kakashi said. So it seems. What do you want to do, Kakashi? Asuma asked. Let's go check it out. The two Jonin took off to the location, somewhere in the woods. Shinji was on the ground bleeding. He looked up to see the grayish chakra leave the man. He didn't know what the hell just happened, but whatever that guy transformed into wasn't normal. He looked like a dog with three tails. He slowly looked up until he was looking Cohen in the face. Cohen spoke. There is no point in killing you. You are not a threat to me. You are a good fighter, and I can see why they couldn't beat you. But against me, you are out of your league. I grew aboard. Cohen turned and walked away from Shinji. He continued to walk until he vanished from sight. The son of the legendary Shinshiro couldn't move. His uncle asked him to do one thing, and he had failed. Shinji was on the verge of passing out. He noticed two figures lay next to him, but the man with gray hair and an eye patch spoke. Can you hear me? What happened and who did this? Shinji was happy to see the headband covering the man's eye was a leaf headband. Konoha, Shinobi, please help my cousin. She headed towards Konoha, make sure that she gets to Naruto Uzumaki. Kakashi propped the man up. How do you know Naruto? My uncle trained him. Kakashi looked at Asuma. We have to get this man to Shizune quickly. He looked back at the man. The little girl. She wouldn't have happened to be the one he stormed through two countries to get, would she? Give him a weak response. Yes, please, save my cousin. I promised her father I would protect. Shinji passed out. Kakashi handed him over to Asma. Get him to Shizune. I think I figured something out here, but I'm not sure how the pieces connect. Have Shizune do everything in her power to heal him. Kakashi vanished out of Asuma's sight. The third son picked up the unconscious samurai and headed towards the campsite. Campsite. Hanabi had gotten the girl to Shizune safe and sound. The Hyuga explained what had happened and who the girl was. Shizune, who was in the tent, was healing the girl. When she came out, she spoke. The girl is lucky that you got her to me in time. However, I can only do enough to stabilize her for now. We have to get her back to Kona for proper treatment. Ten Ten looked at Shizune. Shizune, I'm going to go with Hanabi to aid Konohamaru. Our little prankster is good, but he can't deceive the enemy for long. Tell the others when they get back here, okay? Shizune nodded, and the two Kanoichis left to aid their teammate. She went back into the tent to tend to the little girl's wounds, somewhere in the woods, five minutes later. Konohamaru had run out of tricks. Three ninja from the cloud were playing with the boy who was doing everything he could to fend off their attacks. Konohamaru stood his ground as they surrounded him. He took matters into his own hands as he threw a kunai at Komoko, who easily evaded the attack. Daki threw a shuriken from behind that Konohamaru dodged. However, he was unsuccessful in evading the kunai that hit him in his right shoulder. He was falling to the ground fast, but instead of landing on his back, he flipped around and landed on his feet. He yanked the kunai out of his shoulder and threw it to the ground. Is that all you guys got? I can keep- He was silenced as two kunai pierced his back. Finally, I got you to shut up, you fucking gaki. Komoko pulled out a scroll and unsealed it to reveal a Fuma shuriken. 
She used the center of the shuriken to spin it in her hand. When it had enough speed, she threw it at Konohamaru. Die, you bastard! The blade approached where Konohamaru was laying, but two kunai hit the shuriken, sending it off, of course. Komoko screamed in frustration. Every fucking time someone interferes! The three ninja from Cloud saw Tenten and Tanabi land in front of Konohamaru. Tanabi couldn't believe what she saw when she looked at Konohamaru. He was injured, and it was pretty bad. Tenten removed the kunai and dropped them on the floor. Konohamaru, can you hear me? Yeah, of course. Two kunai in the back can't kill me. He responded in a weak voice. Tenten put her arm around his shoulder and helped him up. You say that now, but you had those kunai been two inches higher, you'd be dead. Consider yourself lucky. Hanabi narrowed her eyes at the three ninjas before her. I gave you the option to leave, but you three will die what you have done to a comrade of mine. She activated her Byaku gun, anger visible in her white eyes. Tenten looked at the Hyuga girl. You can't deny it any longer, Hanabi. I saw the look of panic in her face when he was laying down. Even your actions now, it is clear that you care for this kid. That won't be necessary, Hyuga. The voice caused everyone to turn and face the ninja standing on a branch. Komoko looked at Cohen. I didn't kill the girl. Take care of these ninjas, so I can go after her. The mission is over. We are heading back home now, Cohen stated. The Kanoichi from the cloud narrowed her eyes. I said I didn't kill her. I'm not leaving until I see for myself that she's not breathing. Cone responded calmly. I hate repeating myself, Komoko. This little mission is over. You failed the task that you were given, and now the window is closed. We are leaving here immediately. What's the rush? I thought we could all have some tea over the campfire. Cohen smiled. He turned to his right to see Kakashi leaning on the trunk of the tree that he was on. The copy ninja Kakashi, one of the most feared and respected ninjas. What are the odds? I don't know, you tell me, Kakashi asked, playing along. Cohen shrugged. I wish I knew, maybe your Okage is smarter than what I believed her to be. Maybe, but why are cloud ninjas in fire country? You were at that meeting. So, you of all people know the penalty, Kakashi stated. Yes, but you don't want to enforce it now, do you? Not when you have an injured comrade that needs tending to. We will be on our way, if you don't mind, Cohen said, but Kakashi wasn't done yet. So, why attack the little girl? Does it have something to do with Naruto? Cohen was getting tired of talking and he just wanted to leave. His patience was wearing thin. For the girl below, it does. For me, I could care less if she lives or does. The girl and the guy she was with were never my targets. The only person I see as a worthy challenge is Naruto Uzumaki and Sasuke Uchiha. They are my measuring sticks, if you will. What are your measuring sticks for? I don't quite follow you, Kakashi said, uh, looking at him curiously. You have so many questions, but I don't have enough time to answer them all. You have people that need medical treatment, Kakashi on the Sharingan. I suggest you get them to Konoha. Cohen looked at the Cloud Ninjas. We are leaving. Let's go. Cohen, Daki, Roba all disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Komoko, on the other, remained. I want you all to send a message to the blonde-haired bastard. Tell him that I will find a way to avenge my father's death. He will die a slow and painful death. Komoko disappeared in a cloud of smoke, like her teammates. Kakashi watched them go. He was trying to piece the puzzle together, but some things just didn't fit. 1. Why would uh, cloud ninjas trespass in fire country? What the hell was that chakra that he felt earlier? Why were the daughter of the strongest samurai and her cousin heading to fire country? And what did they need to see Naruto for? Kakashi jumped off the branch and walked up Konohamaru, Tenten, and Tanabi. Kakashi looked at Tenten. We're heading back to the leaf tonight. We might run into the little girl out there. Konohamaru lit this up. Ugh, unnecessary. She's with Shizune. Hanabi looked at him. Stop talking, you idiots. You'll probably make your injuries worse. He gave a weak smile. It's not that bad, Hanabi. I'm okay. Yeah, but we really need to get your wounds healed. Kakashi walked behind Konohamaru to look at his wounds. Two inches higher, and you'd be a goner. Tenten looked over at Hanabi. Hanabi grabbed his other arm. I need you to help carry him. Hanabi nodded and placed Konohamaru's left arm over her shoulders. Let's head back to Tsune, said Kakashi, causing everyone to nod. 
The group headed towards the campsite, fire country, 10 minutes away. Gamabunta was moving as fast as he could. Naruto didn't say anything to Yumi the whole trip. The whole trip was relatively quiet. Campsite. Shizune had treated Konohamaru's wound, walking out of the tent with bandages wrapped around his upper body. He walked to where everyone was sitting by the campfire. Shizune came out right after him. Hanabi had told them that the girl was after Hayami, and that if it had not been for Konohamaru, the girl would have died. Shizune interrupted them. We have a problem. We have to get those two to Konoha within the hour to treat them. I don't see that happening. Kakashi, even with your speed, it would take three hours to get to Konoha. I hate to say it, but that girl is going to need a miracle. Kakashi closed his eyes to think. Shizune tried to make those two as comfortable as possible. She nodded. She gave a soft smile. As she began to walk into the tent, she felt the ground shake. She thought nothing of it. However, it happened again. She looked at Kakashi, who was clueless as well. Everyone looked at one another. Then it happened. Above them was a giant toad mid leap. Kakashi's eyes widened in recognition of the toad. He looked at Shizune. Looks like that girl got her miracle. Kakashi pulled out a kunai from his pouch. I haven't used this in years. Hopefully, Gamabunta will recognize it. Kakashi threw the kunai high in the air. It exploded, causing a red cloud of smoke. Hanabi looked at it curiously. Why did he try to signal that thing? How do you know it's friendly? Kakashi smiled at the girl through his mask. There are only two people who can summon a frog boss, and they are Jiraiya and Naruto. If it's either one of those two, I'm sure both would be more than happy to help with our situation. On Gimbunta, Naruto and Yumi both saw the red cloud. Naruto said out loud, What the hell was that? Gimabunta looked at the light. That's a leaf emergency signal, Naruto. I haven't seen it since the Great Shinobi Wars. Naruto, maybe we should go check it out, Yumi suggested. I don't have time for that. I have other things to tend to, Naruto said in a slightly aggravated tone. Yumi shook her head and screamed at Naruto. I can't believe you! I thought you went to help Hayami, but what if the person that used that signal has a little girl or sister that they want to come home to? You can help, but you won't believe you have other things to tend to? I can't believe the man I love would say something like that. Naruto narrowed his eyes at Yumi. Gimbunta, stop. He continued when the toad stopped. I just saw people I care about die. I want to make sure Hayami and Shinji are okay. Is that so wrong? No, it's not. It's very noble. But what if you can help somebody return home to their loved ones? So their loved ones won't experience what you did tonight. Naruto was still pissed and didn't like the idea, but she was right. He didn't want anyone going through what he went through tonight. He closed his eyes and spoke. Gamabunta, head towards the smoke cloud. The frog leapt in the air and did just that. Campsite. Kashi saw that the frog was heading towards its direction. A minute later, Gamabunta landed about 100 feet away from Kakashi. Gamabunta spoke. Kakashi, why have you signaled me? Kakashi saw Naruto on top of Bunta's head. A miracle. He spoke loud enough for Naruto to hear him. Naruto, am I glad to see you. But the situation here is serious. Naruto jumped off of Bunta's head and landed in front of Kakashi. Naruto spoke up. Hurry, I don't have time to waste. Hanabi spoke. If you're heading to Konoha because of the little girl, there is no need. Naruto looked at Hanabi. What are you talking about? What do you mean there is no need? Shizune came out of the tent. She means that she's in the tent, but she's severely injured. If we don't get her to Konoha in the next hour, she's going to... Naruto knocked Shizune down as he rushed past her. When he entered the tent, he saw Hayami and Shinji lying side by side. I was too late. She got hurt. Shizune came to the tent. Naruto, we have to get her to Konoha. That's why we signaled both of you. With Bunto, we can arrive in less than 20 minutes. And to think, I was going to get to Konoha. Had I done that, you would have surely died. Naruto bent down and pecked at the girl. Shizune, get Kakashi or else I'm going to help Shinji. I have her. Naruto walked out of the tent, ignoring the looks cast his way. He jumped on Gimbunta, landing next to Yumi. Yumi looked at Naruto and at the little girl. A few minutes later, Kakashi and the rest of the gang were on Bunta. Kakashi spoke. Gimbunta, could you please get us to Konoha? Kakashi, if you don't want to walk, then I suggest you don't tell me what to do. Kakashi scratched the back of his head. I didn't mean it like that. I was saying because we have patients that we need attending to. 
Naruto, who was sitting on Bunda's head with Hayami in his lap, spoke in a low voice, but very respectful voice. Bunda, please get us to Kona. The frog never remembered a time when Naruto asked him to do something with respect. That girl must mean a lot to you. Kimabunta leaped in the air. The group was off to Konoha. For some, it was back to home. Twenty minutes later, Konoha. The doctors and nurses were walking about in the hospital, doing their duty. When the hospital shook as if an earthquake happened, everyone looked outside to see a large toad footprint. Hokage Tower. Shinari, who was sleeping on the desk, jumped up when she felt the vibration. A tuning rushed into her office. Lady Shinari! Shizune Kakashi, along with a few others, have arrived and gave Mabunta to the hospital. Shizune jumped up. What? Yes, Lady Okage, it's true. Shizune informed me to tell you to get to the hospital ASAP. Shizune headed to the hospital. So much for her nap. Ten minutes later, at the hospital. Shizune and a couple of other doctors were tending to the little girl. The other doctors were tending to Shinji. Konohamaru, Asma, and Hanabi were in a room across the hall, getting his wounds checked. Naruto was sitting outside of Hayami's room on a bench next to Yumi. Kakashi was leaning against the wall opposite of Naruto. Tenten was sitting next to Yumi. There was complete silence until Tsunade walked up to the group. What is going on here? Naruto and Yumi, why aren't you in Sea Country? Kakashi, why is your squad home early? Tsunade demanded answers for these questions. Naruto was spaced out, looking at the floor, lost in thoughts. Kakashi spoke. Well, uh, from what I can gather from Yumi, it seems that the Nidashu clan has been killed off. The girl she's in is healing, and the guy the other doctors are attending to are the only survivors. Shinade turned to look at Naruto, but he didn't look up. She looked at Yumi, who put her head down. But how? That's just not possible. Naruto spoke for the first time. When it is a strategic military strike, it is possible. That bastard with Raikage did this, along with the help of mist, rain, and rock. Tenten spoke, but I don't get it. Why would they attack one clan? Naruto spoke again, causing everyone to listen. It wasn't about the clan. It was about this sword on my side. Mom told me so before she died. The Raikage, from what she told me, got ninjas from that village to attack with him in a joint strike. They were his pawns, but that really doesn't matter. I plan to give that bastard Raikage what he wants in spades. As for Komoko Sucho... Naruto narrowed his eyes when said that name. If she wants to use Hayami to get my attention, then she has it fully. Kakashi recognized the name. Sujo, as in Tosoku Sujo? Naruto responded. Yes, he was her father and the leader of the Akatsuki. I killed him. Tenten and Kakashi couldn't believe what they were hearing. Here stood a man who took down the leader of the Akatsuki. Who is stronger than Orochimaru and Itachi? How strong have you got, Naruto? Kakashi wondered. The copy ninja shook off that thought, because he now had the pieces to his puzzle. It all makes sense now. The missing ninja in Fire Country, the attack of the clan, that Raikage's tactical smarts is something to be concerned about, Kakashi said. So that he shook her head, knowing what he was getting at. You're right. I knew that there had to be a reason. A reason for what? Asuma said as he, along with Konohamaru and Tanabi, walked up to the group. Shinade turned her head to face him. The missing ninja here in Fire Country. It was all part of the Raikage's plan. He anticipated survivors, which is why he had missing ninjas in Konoha. He knew that Naruto's allegiance to Konoha would have forced clan members to head to Fire Country. However, Kakashi continued. He wouldn't make it because his backup plan wouldn't stop that. He had anticipated that we would send someone stronger than Ko in to do border patrol. His goal was not to leave any survivors, but why? I don't know, Snotty said, perplexed by what the Raikage was thinking. Snotty turned to Asma. I want a signal sent out notifying all Jonin and Chunin to meet with me in an hour. Snotty then gave Naruto a sympathetic look. Naruto, be strong, kid. Shinani looked at Yumi and nodded, both understanding what was said in the nod. Though Kage had basically told her to look after Naruto. Shinani looked at Naruto again, and then she left. After five minutes of silence, Naruto looked up Konamaru, whose upper body was wrapped in gauzes. Naruto spoke in a soft but appreciative voice. Thank you for saving her life for me, Konamaru. 
Konohamaru gave Naruto one of his smiles that showed off all of his pearly whites. It was nothing, bro. One of the nurses walked up to Konohamaru. Konohamaru, you're not supposed to be out of bed. Although your wounds were not life-threatening, you need rest to speed up your recovery. He showed his distaste for the hospital by sighing. Uh, okay, I'll go back to my room for rest. Do you know how long I'll have to stay? Two days. We have to run some tests. It's just standard protocol. She looked at Hanabi. I'll trust you to get him to his room. You all have a nice night. Good morning. Whatever. Just have a good one. The young nurse left them to tend to her business. Ten Ten looked at Konamaru. You should get some rest, Konamaru. She looked at Nami and Kakashi. I think we should head out to the meeting. I'm sure the signal has been sent out. Kakashi nodded, then looked at his former pupil. Naruto was in his own world, not really hearing or seeing anyone. Kakashi knew the pain Naruto was going through. He had been there himself with the loss of Obito, the death of the fourth, and Rin leaving Kanaha. The loss of a loved one was never easy to get over. He prayed that the girl survived for Naruto's sake, and for the sake of everything in this world. The guy stormed through two countries for this girl. What would he do if she died? He didn't even want to think of what would happen. Kashi knew he had to get to the meeting because it was time for Konoha to start really taking things serious. The village of Konoha, one hour later. A bird was flying high in the sky. The bird was flying over Konoha started to make a gawking sound as it flew over the town. The Chiha compound. Sasuke, who was sleeping on his side, woke up at the sound. Meeting at this ungodly hour, he would compound. Neji was broken from his dream as well. So much for a good night's rest before my mission. Kashi's apartment complex. Sakura came into Ino's room fully dressed in the standard journey outfit. Ino Pink, did you- Yes, forehead girl. I'm just putting on my shoes. She stood up and looked at her friend as she barged into her room. Shall we? Sakura nodded, causing them to shunshin out of sight. On the rooftops of Konoha, ninjas were jumping from roof to roof, heading towards the Hokage Tower. It was a flock of ninjas running side by side. The ninjas continued to hop rooftop to rooftop until they reached the Hokage's tower. Five minutes later, meeting room. Snade, Hamura, and Koharu were sitting in their positions on the stage. The various Jonins and Chunins that gathered were waiting for Snade to speak. I have gathered all of you here to inform you that we just got word that the Minasha clan was exterminated. And I said it causing a gasp throughout the crowd. We're familiar with the samurai clan. Shikamaru was the first to speak. So, does that mean that Naruto is dead as well? No, he's actually at the hospital. Although the clan was destroyed, there are two survivors. The daughter of the clan's head and his nephew are the sole survivors. Kakashi's patrol team found the girl and her cousin at the borders of our country being attacked by Cloud Shinobi. So now I said, informing Shikamaru and the other ninjas. Senjuru was standing next to Genma and Raido spoke. The Raikage is responsible for this, isn't he? So he finally made his move, that bastard. Kakashi looked at Senjuru from the other side of his room. And that's not the only thing. He was smart about it too. He hired missing ninjas to pick off the survivors that would flee to fire country. Their connection with Naruto would cause them to seek him out. The plan would have worked had your team not dispatched them. Sasuke spoke, so what are we going to do about our strategy for the upcoming exam? Koharu answered, we will have to wait for a response from our allies. Our officials will meet with their officials and we will discuss strategies and different tactics. Karnai was the next to speak, so what are we going to do now? Are all missions suspended or what? Snade answered the question. No, we have to appear as if nothing happened. If we stop doing our duties, they would know we know about the exams. I want them to think that we are clueless. You know, looked at Tsunade. You said Naruto is at the hospital. I have a question. What is her status update? I don't know. Last I checked, Shizune was tending to the girl, and her cousin was tended to by other doctors. I called this meeting to inform all Jonins and Chunins of what has transpired. I don't know. It doesn't look like it has affected us, but... You may have to ask yourself, if the Rakage could plan an attack of this magnitude and succeed, what is his plan for Konoha? A lot of the Jonins looked at each other, knowing the Cloud were now more than just a passing threat. They were now a pressing threat. What about our allies? Have they been notified of what has transpired? Sakura questioning, expecting Sonata to answer. Homura did instead.
Our fastest carriers were sent out to sand, grass, and waterfall. We should have a response from them in the morning. Sanju spoke once more. Rakage wants to crush whoever is in threat or whatever stands in his way. Konoha stands in his way, and I'm a threat. However, I am no longer his only threat. Who else does he see as a threat? Sasuke asked. The wielder of the legendary Sword of the Heavens, aka Naruto Uzumaki, Sanju stated. So, he's a threat because he carries around a sword? Sasuke asked in a non-believing tone. Sanjuru answered Sasuke's question. Yes, you underestimate what wielding that sword implies. The fact of the matter is, Naruto might be more of an important factor on Aisu's list than me. Naruto has yet to be able to stand against Aisu in combat. Not only that, he has yet to master the sword, which can take years. However, he won't attack Naruto. Well, he can't more or less because Konoha is backing him. Either way, Measures must be taken to deal with this, Raikage. I'll be scheduling more meetings before Zero Hour approaches. You all are dismissed, Sanada said to the shinobi present. Sanjuro knew he wasn't going to get any sleep. He needed to head over to the hospital to check on things. He also wanted to see if Shinji and Hayami were alright. He knew Shinji from past meetings, but he never met Hayami before. He was more worried about Naruto. The boy couldn't be doing well. He needed to see where his head was. Hospital. Naruto was next to Yumi, waiting for an update in her condition. One of the doctors working on Shinji informed him that the man was fine and was just resting. The doctors said he would be up in a couple of hours. A couple of minutes passed, then Shizune came out of the room. Naruto stood up when he saw Shizune. How is she? Shizune took a deep breath and looked Naruto dead in the eyes. Naruto. She's 